Now, I understand that you've got some new funding lately. There was a, a newspaper article. You actually had to shut down the array for a while, but uh, some people came through. I think the actor Jodie Foster came through with a nice donation. Well, Jodie yeah. Foster has, in fact, lent her name and her support to this program. It was called SETI Stars, and it's, uh, it's still ongoing in a, fa in a way. A SETI Stars designed to raise money from the general public, just ordinary folk who think that this is an interesting thing to do. And in two months, they wanted to raise $200,000. We succeeded at doing that, and more than succeeded, actually. I, was, I have to say I was very gratified by the fact that people, even in a time of economic hardship, find it still interesting to do this. No guarantees of success. We need more money to get the array really going for a while. We're looking for those monies now, and uh, I, I think that we, we may get them. And Jody Foster was probably interested because she starred in that movie that was about uh, the SETI project. Contact, yes. Contact, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Written 13, by Carl, Carl Sagan. That's right. Based on Carl Sagan's uh, yeah. 1983 novel, I believe. And in fact, he was involved in, the, in writing the screenplay. So yeah. it's all about publicity. Well, maybe it is. I, I don't know that it's about publicity. I think a lot of people actually know about the SETI enterprise. Maybe, maybe I'm deluding myself here, but I think that they do. Uh, there is always the question of whether they feel that contributing to this project will make a difference. And all I can say is it's a very inexpensive project mm -hmm. compared to almost any other research, and small amounts of money do make a difference. Yeah. Now, we tend to think that um, if we meet an alien civilization, maybe they're a little bit ahead of us scientifically. But if you look at what the human race has done in, say, 100 years, from the time we first discovered how to use electricity as a source of power till the time we put men on the moon, that's about 100 years. A hundred years is nothing in cosmic time. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have civilizations millions of years ahead of us. If development could proceed uninterrupted for a really long time, um, I mean, there could be extraterrestrial civilizations all around us. Maybe they have a prohibition on making contact. But um, if the universe is as old as uh, scientists say it is, and if development could proceed uninterrupted in some places, that would seem like plenty of time to cover you know, an awful lot of ground. Well, there's no doubt about that. I mean, <laughs> clearly, there, there are going to be some worlds where life is less advanced than on Earth. But if life is a very common thing, if it springs up on a lot of planets, then most of the planets with life in the universe are older than the Earth. And what's the average age by which they're older? A couple of billion years, right? So if intelligence has arisen on some of those worlds and uh, you know develops technology and so forth, I mean, their technology could literally be so far beyond ours that it's really quite difficult for us to kind of imagine what it might be like, yes. Let me ask you about the efficacy of your equipment. If you were to take all of your equipment and transport it 50 light years away and point it back at the Earth, mm. do you feel confident that it would detect intelligent life on Earth? Well, <laughs> it would be able to detect some things on Earth. Most things it would not be able to detect. It, the, the equipment we have would not, for example, pick up our television at that distance. But it would pick up some of the stronger radars. There are radars that are powerful enough. So, you know, radars maybe not all that interesting to look at. But, you know, it would tell you, well, you know, I don't know, Zork, but, but there's something on that little blue-green planet capable of building a powerful transmitter. But wouldn't the emanations from the sun tend to drown everything out because the sun would be practically right next to the Earth looking at it from that distance? It would be next to the Earth looking at it from that distance. But, remember, the sun hasn't built a radio transmitter. The sun puts out a lot of radio energy, but it's all over the dial. So, you know, the, the transmitters could drown that out, could easily drown that out. I mean, it's like this. Um, it's, it's, there's plenty of cosmic static, not cosmic static, but just static in your radio caused by the electronics, right? If you tune your AM radio in the old days when you could actually tune it, right, turn the knob, you would hear static everywhere. But as soon as you got to that country and western station that you're really trying to find, right, then it, it just completely drowns out that, that uh, natural static, it would be the, an equivalent situation to somebody looking at our planet from 50, 100, 1,000 light years away. Yes, there would be some background static due to the sun, but that would be very faint compared to our transmitters. We outshine the sun at certain frequencies. So do these telescopes constantly search through different frequencies like a radio looking for a hit? Yeah, indeed, you want to do that because you don't know which frequency you should be examining. Uh, but we don't have a, a, a knob, you know, that, as it were, is sort of mechanically tuned or even electronically tuned, where we just, you know, tune through the dial. Because if you do that, then you're spending all your time at the wrong frequency somehow, right? So what you want to do is you want to be able to listen to all those frequencies at once. That's the intention of the kind of receivers we build.
Is it important to us that we not be alone in the universe? Do we not want to be alone? Maybe it's better to be alone in the universe. Well, Marty, I don't know. I, I don't <laughs> want to intrude on your personal philosophies. I mean, I don't know whether it's better or not. I personally think it would be very interesting to know that we're not alone. Up to this point, you know, we're, we're the crown of creation. We've by self-definition, right? This is it. This is what God intended that, you know, well, it would be very interesting to find that we're not the only kids on the block. And not only that, any of the kids you find, after, the, after all, this argument that you made earlier, any other kids you find are going to be more advanced than we are. Otherwise, you're not going to find mm -hmm. them. Consequently, is that interesting? Yes, because I think it calibrates us. It tells us, you know, we're interesting. We're unique. We are unique, but we're not a miracle. We're not a miracle. Can we learn anything about ourselves by studying extraterrestrial life? Well, you might. I mean, if you found extraterrestrial life on Mars, for example, it might even be related to us. It may be that Mars infected the Earth. Maybe you'd learn something about biology that way. If it wasn't related to us, maybe you would learn something about what biology can do in other circumstances. That might be interesting, too. It's not DNA-based. It's QNA-based or whatever. I mean, you know, there are certain research goals that would be served by finding life elsewhere. But I think that in terms of our culture, which is, after all, what's special about humans, uh, you might learn something if you could understand their message. Because if they're, you know, 100,000 years ahead of you, they might tell you some really interesting stuff. Here's all physics. Here's all astronomy. Here's the cure for death. Here's how to get along. Whatever they're going to tell you. Or maybe greed and desire for dominion are just as powerful at the intergalactic level as they are here. It might be. Darwinian evolution probably obtains everywhere. Yeah. So it could be that they'll be just like ourselves, but a little more advanced and have better tools. I, you know, that's possible. I think it's more likely that it goes in a different direction because I think that we will go in a different direction within a century or two by inventing artificial intelligence. And if you really do that, uh, then that proceeds to evolve much more quickly than biology. And it may be that the aliens have done the same thing so that if we pick up a signal, it's actually coming from machines, not, you know, protoplasmic aliens. Yeah. There's a big question about whether life on Earth really is special. I mean, if life can exist here, you would sort of assume that it could probably exist elsewhere, but we don't really know that you know, in, until we find it. Did, would this change the way we think of ourselves and our position in the universe? Well, I, I think it does. As I say, I think that simply knowing that there's something else out there, that, that what has happened here on Earth happened elsewhere. If you find it in one other place, of course, you know, it's like finding one elephant. <laughs> and if you find a second elephant, you can be sure there are lots and lots mm -hmm. of elephants. So if we find another instance of intelligent life, you can be sure the, you know, the universe is rife with intelligent life. And, and I think that that's interesting uh, because, uh, again, it's like asking, well, what was the function of Copernicus pointing out that the Earth wasn't the center of the cosmos? How did that affect me? I still went to work every day, right? But it really does affect you. We're almost out of time, so let me just ask you one more question. Do you feel personally optimistic that uh, you will see evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence in your lifetime? Well, I am personally sanguine about that. Yes, Marty, I hope so. I mean, I might get hit by a you know, bus tomorrow, and that would probably reduce my chances a bit. But honestly, if you look at the speed at which the searches are improving, they're following what's called Moore's Law, something well known to this program, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And, and consequently, I think the next 20 years could prove to be the amount of time required to pick up a signal. Okay, and we're going to have to break on that note because we are out of time. This is Marty Wasserman for Future Talk. See you next time. <laughs>